This is a very important specificity of European and international cooperation when we speak about European capitals of culture, because there is no European capital of culture without European cooperation or even international cooperation. Otherwise, it would be national or local capital of culture. But we are European capital of culture, so it's per se already a project targeted to European and international cooperation. It's at the core of all these activities. And then, in addition, in European capitals of culture, we are having, you remember very well when you did the bidding process, we are having this European dimension chapter, but in a way, European dimension, and in that sense, already European exchange and cooperation is a transversal topic, of course. It's something which concerns literally everything in a European capital of culture, and it's also very well reflected for example, that we are having tomorrow this focus on communication, which is part of the management parts of our European capital of culture marketing. And we already understand also from there that it is international. It's per se not only limited to project cooperation. And I highlighted that with another slide. You see here again the different focal points of a European capital of culture. And on all these levels, we are having European and international cooperation and can benefit from the ed related added value. So when we think, for example, about the cultural strategies, we are having, for example, this cooperation of universities or, uh, in epoch cities. Yeah. So this, uh, there is a lot of exchange also related to evaluation practices and methods and tools. Uh, so all this is international and European cooperation. Of course, it's an artistic program. This is the core in that sense with mobilities and residencies, co-productions, all kinds of, of European exchange. But then of course, it's also in European themes. Uh, so when we look a little bit around on the different themes, it's uh, about architectural policies, it's about the future of tourism, it's about sustainability, it's about participation, and all this is also European. It's not only local. It's not only something you are doing in your own city. It's something many, many cities everywhere in Europe are doing. And the European capitals of culture allow for a related exchange, for a related peer learning, for a related cooperation benchmarking or stealing good practices. <laughs> we can also <laughs> name it like that. So benefit from all these uh, brain food you can get uh, everywhere. Also in outreach, connecting citizens on a European level. We had many uh, projects also in European capitals that attempt to try out new methods also really to connect citizens on the European level. Of course, they should be involved also in your program, but on the other hand, uh, to go far beyond. We talked already about management, the communication part, but there is a lot more of international and European exchange related to that. It's interns from other ECOGs, it's job shadowing activities, it's exchanges on management practices, it's common initiatives like a recent one, the ECOGs in Dubai, for example, you have maybe followed that a little bit or maybe even participated. And also, of course, policy-related cooperation. So we speak in the big books about capacities uh, to deliver, but this is also about political commitment. And then there are also, for example, meetings of mayors in order to go ahead with the ECHO project, also to have uh, high-level interventions. I think there is also several elements we still uh, need to take into consideration, and this goes now beyond the ECHO uh, context. So I first wanted to provide a little bit of the, the context of the ECHOs and to link that also to all these different dimensions of European and international cooperation. <laughs> But in general, European and international cooperation has a lot of different layers, dimension, 
elements and considerations to be taken into account, like the narratives, like policies. I will then also specify these elements. Then also the principles of cooperation, how you do cooperation. There are specific cooperational frameworks and then the different management aspects, like, for example, what we are talking more today is the, the partnership. Let's go to the narratives. And let's uh, reflect a little bit on that. There is no specific uh, slide. So just um, to uh, understand that there is so many ways to tell the story of European or international cooperation. So it can be historic ties. Just when I look at, at, at Fran, uh, there is so many family uh, relations, but it can be also something more official, like the Francophonie. And then there is Institute of Francophonie, and then there is programs, there is activities. All these can be used in a way. All these can be integrated also then in uh, European programs. There is geographic links which can uh, play a role. So when we are just in this area, we are having, for example, Danube strategy uh, or Danube river in, in general. Um, then there can be also, of course, economic interest. We have here also a lady responsible for merchandising. So when we speak about uh, relations in the context of creative industries, there is lots of possibilities to link that also maybe to bigger uh, commercial spaces like the European Union, but also like Mercosur. So there is so many uh, talking uh, points where, where these this, this projects can be also enhanced and brought on, on, on a bright, broader, broader pers perspective. Uh, then on policies, uh, there is so many tools and methods which are used and which can be then also used for the own projects or to which uh, we, can, we can link. So, for example, international strategies like the New Silk Road, for example, or the whole diplomacy initiatives, cultural diplomacy, scientific diplomacy, for example, with Rijeka 2020, I did a project in the framework of a big European cultural diplomacy uh, conference. We made a workshop between European and African capitals of culture where also participants from West Brim were involved. So we can link that to so many, to so many elements. The same also again, uh, free trade agreements. Uh, then we can also have below state uh, in uh, level internationalization, for example, from the world culture cities, a big network of big metropolises doing research work together, doing programs together. International organizations, I look again to France with UNESCO, for example, who was working also for UNESCO. And then internationalization with NGOs uh, and, and umbrella organizations. So the whole networks we are having, also the music sector, for example, or there is, of course, also we will have during the break additional program with uh, Culture Action Europe. So uh, there is a lot of activities and, of course, individual plans and strategies uh, like the international strategy for my company, InfoVeli, or the internationalization strategy from InterArt. So in that sense, what, what is important for me at the very beginning that we get a wide picture that we see that there are lots of opportunities beyond uh, kind of what we have often in mind when we speak about artistic and cultural exchange. It's often so we bring an artist or we have some mobility. It goes far beyond, we can think it far broader and wider and especially the ECHO project allows for a broad thinking because it's cross-sectoral, it's broad in that sense. It has so many social, economic, cultural, urban development, economic dimensions so that we are having really, I would say, a shelf full of, of, of options and opportunities. 
uh, then related to the, and I think I will be much too long, uh, and then I think related to uh, EU policies. I, it's also a very important advantage we are having in the framework of European capital of culture, because European cooperation and integration is at the heart of EU policies. And in that sense, we are in an extremely privileged situation in Europe because normally cultural operators, they are having a local level where they operate and then in some uh, countries, a regional level, and, uh, but most often it's local and national level. But in Europe, we are having in addition the EU level and the EU level is already meant for European cooperation and has a full set of instruments and of activities in place on which we can build on all these cross-border transnational Europe-wide activities. And in addition, we have, and exactly now, uh, it's a moment where we are extremely privileged related to that, we are having again the funding instruments available for the next uh, seven years. So in that sense, if we compare that also with rich areas like, like North America, we are in a very privileged situation. We have a wealth of funding instruments, a wealth of structures and of, of uh, activities already in place, which we just need to choose and to contact and to work on. And in that sense, I think it's a very uh, nice uh, framework. And we are having lots of uh, interesting priority topics uh, on EU level. So when I look at the different cultural policies, we have, for example, still a lot of ongoing activities in cultural heritage, which uh, gained a lot of interest also related to the European Year of Cultural Heritage in 2018. In music, we are having big strategic projects with uh, Music Moves, moves Europe uh, in creative industries. We are having, for example, the new European Bauhaus initiative connecting with architecture and design, new materials, and also with sustainability, uh, mobility. Uh, we are having programs like iPortunos, etc., etc. Uh, in addition, there is a, a cultural strategy for Europe. That means we are having also there a clear framework on which we, we can build on a work plan for culture uh, from the EU member states where they uh, have their priority, for example, also uh, sustainability in cultural heritage or the status of the artist in order to have good working conditions. Uh, also building culture and architecture. So lots and lots of things. And all this also allows again for uh, European and international activities in the framework of a European capital of culture. Because in all these areas is research activities, is conferences, is publications, is networks, is, is uh, expert exchange. So I think it's more uh, getting difficult to choose uh, where uh, maybe to, to put the focus on, but there are lots and lots of opportunities and, and with this very special situation of the European continent. And this brings me also to another strategic paper on, on EU level. This is the EU strategy for international cultural relations. This one was uh, published in 2016 and it explicitly foresees also beyond Europe cooperation of the European capitals of culture. So we will have also guests this afternoon from Canada, for example, but also uh, we did already activities in, uh, in Asia, in East Asia related to, uh, to this uh, uh, policy priority and also in Africa, for example. So in that sense, uh, also uh, to see Europe in the context of the wider global perspective is clearly a will uh, on, on the EU level and also um, uh, in that sense foreseen and, uh, and welcome. So that means this makes the 
uh, boxes of opportunities even even bigger as uh, already already said before then uh, for i'm coming now to more practical uh, things principal operational frameworks and uh, partnerships and uh, when we see uh, the principles um, there is uh, already from the from the way how we are doing European cooperation projects, and this is also something we will then further elaborate also on Friday, that there is a clear will uh, here to have a really integ integrative approach so that we work on co-design uh, of in, in uh, co-design cooperation project co-creation to do things together yeah beyond inviting really developing projects together then there is also an upcoming discussion to do these projects um, in a participative governance way yeah so to get rid of the stronger and of the weaker parts in a project to work as equal partners with transparency and also fair financial flows um, there is an increasing also reflection on the global dimension of all what we do also in local projects for example also related to sustainable development goals and uh, there is, uh, and I look again at Fran, you are having very important uh, uh, topics in your agenda. Uh, it's the respect of cultural diversity and also of cultural rights, and that this should be also reflected in all projects of European and international cooperation. And what we have also discussed and still to remain in this more operative uh, element uh, is the pandemic and the pandemic influence considerably, of course, all what is European and international cooperation, uh, very heavily, partly in 2020 with border closings, but still uh, traveling is more complicated. It's sometimes more expensive, depending where you are going, sometimes you need additional tests and what we also have and I think this is a crucial element is that we are having a weakening of many cultural organizations and also freelancers and these are these people we also need in order to build up big programs and we know also that uh, organizations need to be a, a certain have to have a certain stability in order to be able also to go international because international or also European normally takes more time can uh, have a need of additional resources and so in that sense it's maybe also question how to reinforce uh, local cultural organizations and sectors in order to empower them also in this pandemic uh, context to still go international and to still do European projects then in addition, we are having a whole framework related to mobility. So mobility is crucial, we want to meet. So all the European projects in a way or in another will be then linked to mobility. And there we, on the one hand, again, we are very privileged in Europe that we are having a whole ecosystem in place for example, with mobility information points and with a whole set of, of uh, uh, networks and, 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 and assistance and support. But on the other hand, we are still having a bureaucracy, we are having troubles with visa, depending who is, is traveling. And of course, uh, there is also an upcoming discussion about sustainable mobility, how to do that, uh, but still to allow uh, mobility because it's also about cultural rights. So this is also something which is very, very crucial. And then there is also a certain political framework uh, which can make uh, European cooperation and international cooperation more or less complicated. But what we have also seen now again related to the pandemic, that um, the funds for international cooperation, which are provided on, on national level, have rather tendency to, to be lower than before. 
Yeah, so because there is this uh, observation, there is less mobility, so maybe also less need for funds. When we speak then about management, this has many dimensions, maybe just to give some uh, keywords. It's about motivation, it's about skills, it's about partners, financing, it's about planning, it's about methods, it's about governance, it's about communication and evaluation. And all this also applies on project and on organizational level. And so this is also, and I refer again to what I have said at the beginning, uh, we cannot do it all. Yeah, so we could discuss about all this for, for many, many days. So our focus will be on partners financing and, and communication. And in partnership, uh, we thought we make uh, uh, two, three uh, focal points. Um, one is really uh, to further stress the fact that there are so many uh, possibilities to cooperate within uh, the European capitals of culture and cultural capitals of the world. So this will be Steve Green, who will provide us uh, uh, additional insight into these elements and I think he's already online and waiting for his intervention in a few minutes. Then we will have Heidi Vogels who will uh, speak about networks and residences also and how to further cooperate and that I'm very happy again with Victoria uh, being with us uh, from the Vesper Puppet Theatre and who will give very practical local insights about her way of doing a project and also to show uh, that uh, many, many uh, elements can be developed also on, on, local, on local level. And in the afternoon, we will then have the Canada Arts Council who will uh, provide us with further insights about concrete cooperation opportunities with uh, Canada. And this brings me also to another strategic paper on, on EU level. This is the EU strategy for international cultural relations. This one was uh, published in 2016 and it explicitly foresees also beyond Europe cooperation of the European capitals of culture. So we will have also guests this afternoon from Canada, for example, but also uh, we did already activities in, uh, in Asia, in East Asia related to, uh, to this uh, uh, policy priority and also in Africa, for example. So in that sense, uh, also uh, to see Europe in the context of the wider global perspective is clearly a will uh, on on the EU level and also um, uh, in that sense foreseen and, uh, and welcome. So that means this makes the uh, boxes of opportunities even, even bigger as uh, already, already said before. Then uh, for, I'm coming now to more practical uh, things, principle, operational frameworks and uh, partnerships. And uh, when we see uh, the principles, um, there is uh, already from the, from the way how we are doing European cooperation projects, and this is also something we will then further elaborate also on Friday, that there is a clear will uh, here to have a really integ integrative approach so that we work on co-design uh, of in, in, uh, co-design cooperation projects, co-creation, to do things together, yeah, beyond inviting, really developing projects together. Then there is also an upcoming discussion to do these projects um, in a participative governance way. Yeah? So to get rid of the stronger and of the weaker parts in a project to work as equal partners with transparency and also fair financial flows. Um, there is an increasing also reflection on the global dimension of all what we do also in local projects, for example, also related to sustainable development goals. 
And uh, there is, uh, and I look again at Fran, you are having very important uh, uh, topics in your agenda. Uh, it's the respect of cultural diversity and also of cultural rights, and that this should be also reflected in all projects of European and international cooperation. Then what we have also discussed and still to remain in these more operative uh, elements uh, is the pandemic and the pandemic influence considerably, of course, all what is European and international cooperation, uh, very heavily, partly in 2020 with border closings, but still uh, traveling is more complicated. It's sometimes more expensive, depending where you are going. Sometimes you need additional tests. And what we also have, and I think this is a crucial element, is that we are having a weakening of many cultural organizations and also freelancers. And these are these people we also need in order to build up big programs. And we know also that uh, organizations need to be uh, certain, have to have a certain stability in order to be able also to go international because international or also European normally takes more time, can uh, have a need of additional resources. And so in that sense, it's maybe also a question how to reinforce uh, local cultural organizations and sectors in order to empower them also in this pandemic uh, context to still go international and to still do European projects. Then in addition, we are having a whole framework related to mobility. So mobility is crucial, we want to meet. So all the European projects in a way or in another will be then linked to mobility. And there we, on the one hand, again, we are very privileged in Europe that we are having a whole ecosystem in place, for example, with mobility information points and with a whole set of, of uh, uh, networks and, 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 and assistance and support. But on the other hand, we are still having a bureaucracy, we are having troubles with visa, depending who is, is traveling. And of course, uh, there is also an upcoming discussion about sustainable mobility, how to do that, uh, but still to allow uh, mobility because it's also about cultural rights. So this is also something which is very, very crucial. And then there is also a certain political framework uh, which can make uh, European cooperation and international cooperation more or less complicated. But what we have also seen now again related to the pandemic, that um, the funds for international cooperation, which are provided on, on national level, have rather tendency to, to be lower than before. Yeah, so because there is this uh, observation, there is less mobility, so maybe also less need for funds. When we speak then about management, this has many dimensions, maybe just to give some uh, keywords. It's about motivation, it's about skills, it's about partners, financing, it's about planning. It's about methods, it's about governance, it's about communication and evaluation. And all this also applies on project and on organizational level. And so this is also, and I refer again to what I have said at the beginning, uh, we cannot do it all. Yeah, so we could discuss about all this for, for many, many days. So our focus will be on partners, financing and, and communication. And in partnership, uh, we thought we make uh, uh, two, three uh, focal points. Um, one is really uh, to further stress the fact that there are so many uh, possibilities to cooperate within uh, the European capitals of culture and cultural capitals of the world. So this will be Steve Green who will provide us uh, uh, additional insight into these elements and I think he's already online and waiting for his intervention in a few minutes. Then we will have Heidi Vogels who will uh, speak about networks and residences also and how to further 
cooperate. And then I'm very happy again with Victoria uh, being with us uh, from the Vesper Puppet Theater and uh, who will give very practical local insights about her way of doing a project and also to show uh, that uh, many, many uh, elements can be developed also on, on, local, on local level. And in the afternoon, we will then have the Canada Arts Council who will uh, provide us with further insights about concrete cooperation opportunities with uh, Canada. Who am I, Steve Green? Why am I here? I suppose it's because I spent five years on the selection panel and I chaired it for three years. I have 150 bid books um, for my sins and 149 presentations for my deeper sins. And also four years ago, I wrote a paper, I'll give you the details later, on all the capitals of culture around the world. The ECOP is not alone. And uh, since leaving the panel five years ago, I've occasionally helped candidates, uh, never got paid, but I've helped them, um, and taken part in workshops um, on capitals of culture, not just in Europe, but around the world. So that's who I am. Uh, I have to explain my background it has a slight relevance. Many of you may recognize it as a David Hockney painting of a rather expensive swimming pool and house in Los Angeles. The difference is that the people in the painting are not the very rich, um, artistic minded, culturally minded people that Hockney painted, but the cleaners who can't afford to go to the arts. It's a very nice sort of subtle technical political painting. It also works with, as Sylvia said, outreach and audience development. So what am I gonna talk about? It says on the agenda how best to cooperate with capitals of culture outside and within Europe. In practice, I'm going to expand it to cover some of the issues that Sylvia has just talked about and give practical links and background to some of the other organizations working in the fields within both culture and within the narratives, as Sylvia said. Why is this important now? I think it is because it's a cliche to say we're in a period of change. We've always been in a period of change since the Neolithic age. But now, in the next decade or so, the world has to change or the change will hit the world. Yes, COP26 occupied most of our thoughts in the last few weeks, climate emergency, um, the breakdown of politics in many parts of the world, including Central Europe. And I think ECOCs will not be able just to carry on within their nice, comfortable parameters as they did in the 1990s, 2000s, and even the 2010s. An interesting point was made by Barbara Gessler, who heads the unit in the European Commission, which looks after the ECOCs. There was a meeting at the European Parliament last week. And one of the points she made about ECOCs was that the European Union now has three overriding objectives for the next seven years or so. And these permeate all activities of the union. And she said it in a way quite deliberately that said, these three add to the objectives and competencies of ECOCs. It expands the objectives beyond the six criteria you all went through to get selected. So I will look later on at some of the ways these avenues can be explored. Uh, no PowerPoint, I tend to dislike them, I, but I have prepared speaking notes, which I'll send to Sylvia for distribution afterwards. What I'm gonna talk about is in three sections, basic, intermediate, advanced. So I'm gonna start with the basic. 
the Ecock family. You all link with your fellow Ecocks, with candidates from your own country sometimes, with Ecocks from previous manifestations and sometimes some still to come. There's the Ecock family meetings twice a year. Sometimes these links are more than simple visits. They're critical for learning. What are you doing? How did you get over this problem? Did you really have that problem with your ministry? How do you deal with that blank, blank, blank mayor? The common problems of ETOX, politics, the ego of the mayor, the incompetence and un misunderstanding by ministries of culture. These are all useful and essential and to a large extent happen. So I'm going to move on. One, of course, network that your local university, or at least one of them, will join the university network of capitals of culture. And indeed, the Vesprem University, the University of Pannonia, is the current hosting the secretariat. So their website is very useful to find sometimes rather obscure academic type papers. They are universities after all. Um, but there's experience sometimes comes through, of, oh, that could be helpful, as well as theory of cultural policy, which is for a completely different planet. But are these enough? No, in my view. At the intermediate level, I go back to say the ECOC is not alone. Since the European City of Culture, program was founded in 1985 in Athens, thanks to Melina McCurry and Jacques Lang, there have been 37 other programs around the world. Now, these are what I call programs. They're not when a city itself jumps up with its marketing department and says, we're a cultural capital. Now, there's several thousand cities try to claim that. But these are where there is some sort of organization behind the designation now, some of them only lasted once. Ireland, Korea, others only lasted a few editions, two or three. Why did they stop? Politics. The, a new political party took over the government or the regional government and had different priorities. The 37 have been organized by intergovernmental networks like the European Union, the Asian Association of Asian Nations, the um, Southeast Asian, South Asian Regional Cooperation, uh, the Commonwealth of Independent States, the, the former Soviet Union minus the Democrats. The others have been organized by national governments, by regional governments, and in a couple of cases by NGOs, and in two by a private individual who's established a very long running series of for two capitals of culture and very profitably. Each year, there's probably around 20 to 25 other capitals of culture. Some are very limited. They're not much more than an arts festival organized around a ministerial meeting. That's a government meeting. Others do nothing. In the Organization of Islamic States, they nominated three or four cities over the next decade in 2015, and many of the cities now reaching their nomination are somewhat surprised that they are nominated and finish up doing nothing. Others do an enormous program. Most of them are very small, certainly compared to the ECOC, and many of them have budgets of less than 5 million euros. Let me give you some examples, which I've already started. The Union of Capital Cities of Ibero-America. Uh, that mostly is in South America. Mexico City is the one this year. Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, which is probably the international network with the biggest um, trajectory towards the European Union. The Arab League and the Organization of Islamic Countries through their respective regional UNESCO branches, independent branches, but shadowing UNESCO. 
the Commonwealth and the Turkic Council, which covers the Turkic speaking world. And I noticed that their, the chief executive who runs the, their Turksoy organization visited Novi Sad earlier this year. At national level, it's interesting to learn that Canada will be speaking this afternoon as they were the first country outside the EU to run a program. And it was a very innovative one and one I think the EU can learn for post-2033 when the current decision ends. The Canada programme had three levels, small communities, medium communities and large cities, which meant you didn't have a small city of 20,000 in competition with a 4 million city. Lithuania was the first EU country to jump on the bandwagon followed by the UK, Italy, Slovakia, Ukraine, and next year, France. Regional ones have been very interesting. There's a very interesting one in Aisho Atlantico. And I see you desperately searching Google to find out where Aisho Atlantico is. It's the EU region made up of Northern Portugal and Galicia in Spain, a cross-border region. Krasnoyarsk in Russia, near, in Siberia, has a very good programme. And interestingly, now London has a competition between its boroughs. As a city of 8 million, it doesn't need much cultural support, but individual boroughs, uh, mostly with populations of 300,000, swamp most ECOCs. At NGO level, I'll mention the one which I find the most fascinating when we come to the term culture, which is the finno ugric which is a non-political based uh, administrative, not even administrative area, but it's a pure cultural area extending from Estonia through Hungary, out through Russia. And that has a very interesting um, capital of culture program with a very um, severe uh, selection process. And Catalan, I will mention, I have to be living in Spain, unfortunately, but this is one of the two with the American one, which is run by a private individual. And has, although it reads as though it is a mirror image of the ECOP, in fact, is a, a private person without any competition, but he trapes around both Catalonia and the Americas asking for money to run for the privilege of holding a title. It's the first um, private sector ECOP or ECOP. So to look at a few examples, the UK one I'm starting with, partly because it's unique, it runs every four years, not every year. And its budget and its operations and its objectives is the closest to an ECOP. Coventry, the current holder, um, was held the title for this year, but when COVID came along, it split the year. So it started in May this year and will run till May next year and has managed to get a full programme in, unlike Paul Gal Galway and Rieka. It also has the most innovative capital of culture budget programme that I've seen for many years, which is really engaging with citizens in the country, in the city, and not simply those who normally turn up to arts events or a big jamboree in the city centre. Its budget is also over 35 million euros. Two years time, Leeds will not be a city of culture and it will not be a European capital of culture because that disaster called Brexit stopped it from bidding. But it's running virtually all its programme anyway because it felt the programme was worth running regardless of not being able to be in the EU. Again, its budget is going to be over 30 million euros. The next UK one is in 2025 and the current shortlist of eight cities will know who wins next year in May. The latest one to launch their programme for next year is in Italy, where an island First time an island has held a title, um, Procida, just outside Naples. It launched its programme this week with 150 events, 350 artists from 45 countries. It's going to be one of the best Italian cities of culture. 
its um, catchphrase is international dimension, inclusion, and eco-sustainability are the key words. In a framework of poetry and active participation of citizens. Hmm, I think many ECOPs could pick up those words. In 2023, there were two Italian capitals of culture in a twin approach, Bergamo and Brescia. And why are there two? And why did they not have a competition? It's because last year, they were the two Italian cities hardest hit in the first wave of COVID. And the selection for the 2024 city is now underway. Lithuania, Ukraine, Slovakia have small cities of culture, which probably from an ECOP point of view are good in regional context rather than long distance. Bursa, the third city in Turkey, often overlooked, is the Turkic capital of culture. These ones sometimes have an extremely good program, other times rather late and hurriedly put together. But as I mentioned, they've already made overtures to Novi Sad and I hope to other ECOCs in the um, Central Europe to make a increased partnerships. Further afield, their previous cities of culture were basically tourist promotion activities, which is one of the, the banes, I think, of an ECOC that cities just see it as a tourist marketing promotion rather than a fundamental change. In my view, as I've said quite frequently, bidding for an ECOC means that the organisers think that the cultural sector in their city is not fit for the next five or six years at least, and that the cultural sector in the city, far from just simply being a promotion tool, needs to radically change. I liked on the selection of Novi Sad, for example, where they told us, the committee, the selection panel, that most of the arts in their city is just Serbian, and that the arts managers in the city just thought nationally and any international activity just meant Serbs living in Croatia, which didn't really help matters. Um, and that one of the aims of the ECOC of Novi Sad was to internationalize the cultural managers in the city, hopefully before they are retired. There are two new ECOCs starting roughly next year. One, and I think probably during the couple of days after, Sylvia can tell you more, is in Africa. Um, there was a slight controversy last year when Marrakesh initially held the title and then it was um, stolen by Rabat. So, but Rabat holds the title this year and next year. And the, the aim was that the next African capital of culture will be in two or three years time. On, in the EU, France at last, after many years of trying, launched its capital of culture and the first edition is next year, and a town called Villeurbanne will hold it, which is, if you look on the map, people will, may mistake it, and I'm gonna get shot by their residents as a suburb of Lyon, but it's an independent city. The French competition again was good because it limited applicants to cities between 20,000 and 200,000. And as I mentioned with Canada before, I think this is something the EU has to explore after 2033 um, of what size of cities can co compete to make a European impact rather than necessarily a local one. The mayor of Villeurbanne said, we did not want to offer a succession of events that shine to the moon. We are almost lost on that. I think that's a very good point nowadays. But we didn't go into an excess of place marketing. We won't be in city breaks. However, we have a story to tell to those who will pass by. It is a space of possibilities and utopias. And I think that's a very brave statement in the light of how many people talk and indeed think of ECOCs and capitals of culture. The ones around the world, outside of the European dimension area, vary tremendously. The Arab 
capital of culture at times is really good and gives a very good artistically centered um, program. Luxor in Egypt a couple of years ago was extremely good. Uh, others are victims of the politics. So Al-Quds or Jerusalem was um, underwhelming to say the least because of the politics. The Islamic capital of culture can be brilliant. Marshed in uh, Iran three years ago did a fantastic program. Uh, it's the third city in Shia Muslim uh, Islam, and it did a wonderful program of artistic events with a heavy emphasis, as the title involves, on Islamic uh, arts, history, calligraphy, cultural architecture. But some Islamic ones just fade into nothing. The American title people look at and tend to think, oh, there's an American capital of culture program. It's nothing like any others. It's one run by this private individual. And um, he basically asked them to pay anything from 20 to 200,000 euros to join. Now I'll move on very quickly to the advanced. And this is where I'm going to pick up some of the points that came in Sylvia's introduction on narratives and international dimension. You probably know about EU sport and EU youth um, programs and titles. But there are several now relatively new ones, which I think are more relevant to join partnership with. The EU Green Capital is an obvious one to move. It's Grenoble next year and Tallinn, the next ECOC the year after. And here for those who I think Eco sustainability, the climate emergency must be fundamental to every ECOC now. It would be very, very disappointing if a future ECOC does not really manage its own emissions, does not really say how we are cutting our emissions and behaving sustainably. Um, not just awareness programs in the arts world, but as a practical management tool. Smart tourism, is a new EU program. Innovation, accessibility, and sustainability are the future of tourism. So your tourism boards and um, people really need to get engaged with these. A very nice one just starting is the EU Access Award, which is for those with disabilities. And again, this goes back to the ECOP intention of outreach and audience development. How can your citizens actually get to arts events without bad transport into the city centre where the arts facilities are, or having to walk upstairs in a simple one within a museum. Um, Chongqing in Sweden is this year, uh, was last year's, uh, the, the next year programme will be announced in December. And then three on the creative industry side, Valencia, where I live, is the world design capital next year a title held every two years. UNESCO Creative Cities are an obvious area. And I think various ECOPs have them already members of one of the categories of the UNESCO team. And the Council of Europe Intercultural Cities, which I think is fundamental now, that as we become more and more integrated within society, with the exception of a few certain political leaders who are living in the 18th century. But as Europe becomes more multicultural, assimilated, multicultural, you take your pick. We are no longer the white Christian bastion of the 17th century. So the Council of Europe's intercultural cities um, are a key one. And to summarize, before I run out of time, I've already run out of time, an ECOC city will appear in the European Commission's Cultural and Creative Cities Monitor, a publication every two years, which looks at now 190 European cities and assesses them on a wide range of factors. And these illustrate, not in a competitive sense, in a, but in a comparative sense, just how integrated culture and creativity is in cities. It's good for peer comparisons and to wake your mayors up and politicians up 
to see what culture and creativity actually mean in today's world. You don't need an ECOP to promote your own city. I was very disappointed looking at the front page of one. I think they'll probably be in the room at the moment where there was virtually no mention of bringing Europe into the city so that the citizens know the diversity of cultures, not to put notice the plural in the EU or in Europe at the moment. Successfully, cops by any stretch of the imagine have over 50% of their events with non-national participation, co-creation, inviting in, multiple workshops. It's the diversity of cultures in the EU that need to be celebrated, not single cultures. So what I hope I've done is given an overview of some of the other organisations and areas where you can go for partnerships. When, as Sylvia said again, you settle the focus on what you're doing. My own approach would be the focus for the next, well, forever, but certainly for ECOX from now until 2033, is that ecological sustainability must be first and foremost on all of your programmes and in all of your individual events. I'm working for Trans Artists, uh, that's part of Dutch culture. And Trans Artists is an organization that is dedicated to uh, collect uh, information about artist residency programs that are spread all over the world. And we do that through uh, our website, that's our main tool. This is an online database of uh, residency programs and we have collected so far around 1,500 different programs. Um, that are listed here and this is the way how we think like artists we, we try to open up these uh, opportunities for artists so they can uh, browse through the website and the database and see what kind of programs can be interesting for them um, that is um, we were founded in 1996 so we have been around already quite for some time um, that means that uh, we are not the only ones who uh, offer information about residency programs, but yeah, at least we, we kind of grew into the process also of how so many more residencies came to be during the last 20 years. So that is nice also that we have this uh, overview or this helicopter view in a way concerning the different networks and also the different programs that are around. I think also what is interesting to start with a really basic question is what is actually a residency program? What makes residencies interesting, I think, is that they are, um, they all have, they start from this notion for artists to be uh, allowed to work some other place for a certain amount of time. And when you have that covered, uh, then basically everything is possible. And that means that you have residencies that are like functioning like a big in, inside of a big institution that allow artists a stepping stone for their careers. So you can think, for example, at Schloss Solitude in Germany or the Rijksakademie in, in Amsterdam. But you also have residency programs that are part of exhibition spaces or projects that are set up uh, by uh, small um, independent initiatives or, part, or run by artists that are part of a studio building. And you also have residencies that um, are looking for more unusual places like this uh, container ship, for example. This is an example of a residency that is, uh, an, the organization is based in Canada. And some years ago, they managed to have residency uh, on the board of a container ship. So artists could, um, take a ride and uh, sail or like go with this, with this ship all over the world and make their projects from that context. And I think that is interesting in a way because it gives an example of how as a residency can uh, open up a space inside of an existing context and allowing an artist to uh, land there and to work and produce from inside allowing us in that, uh, in that sense also uh, an insight view uh, through their projects about maybe sort of some worlds that are normally are not accessible or are not um, 
really on our scope. So in that sense, I think you can see residency almost like a political tool as well. It just depends how the organizers wish to, uh, what ambitions they have and uh, where you want to uh, focus on. So what residencies mostly have in common is this uh, focus. Oh, sorry, here we see the database, uh, slide of the database, and I will move already with my story a little bit elsewhere. What I would like to stress is that residencies are always with this focus on artistic development and research instead of presentation and um, just for the outside world for people to encounter with art is more for the artistic development and also for connecting with the context of a place. So that, um, that already has this element of sustainability, of course, in itself with it. And that, that is something that has been there always. And that can also be, uh, uh, I think, our focus when we uh, want to uh, move into the future and to um, how can we uh, utilize residencies also uh, from that aspect. And so if you can think of residencies like that, then they can become a catalyst for um, of, uh, uh, receiving guests, a catalyst for encounters and exchange production and presentation. And they're always well embedded in the cultural and social fabric of a place. Then another aspect from residencies is the perspective of the organization. This is where Air Platform NL comes in, at least from our side of uh, trans artists. Uh, Air Platform NL is a network of residency organizations in the Netherlands and also Flanders. And uh, we have started this uh, also many years ago as a way to support organizations of residency programs to come together and to um, uh, create a context for meeting, exchange, and visibility towards one another, but also towards the outside world. And um, this also allows for investing into a more fertile um, environment for these programs also to thrive and to connect with each other and to uh, support them in their programs. So from the beginning also what Red, uh, Air Platform NL did is that we focused uh, not just on bringing them together, but also to uh, explore how can we bring those different networks of residencies together. So there is also more exchange between um, other countries. So we started with a focus, for example, between the Netherlands and Belgium, and we organized programs and bus tours and uh, symposia with um, um, our um, neighbors in Germany with the rural area and to always from this focus like how can you build up relationships that um, that that really are going to thrive so you could think of me uh, organizing a meeting just one meeting and you go back home and it was fantastic and you were inspired but you can also think of building up programs over the course of a couple of years so you allow um, a certain discourse that you start with each other or exchange you have with each other to take place in different stages. And well, at least in our experience that can, um, if you manage to incorporate that in your programs and in your projects, that allows for uh, things more to solidify, I think. And that is also a certain way to invest in the future to, um, you, you, you create a situation of um, familiarity between each other and affinity. So you can, uh, you know where to find each other also for other projects and for other uh, questions, or you create a more, I think, uh, sustainable and flexible working environment. So we did that also with Russia, for example, and that's in, the, in some years ago, that was a project that we explored different regions in Russia, visited that also with other residencies, and also invited those residencies back to the Netherlands. And um, that was actually taking place over the course of four years. And I think that, that was of course also quite exceptional because funding doesn't always allow to, um, to, to, to develop projects that reach more into the future. So it's always a strategy of um, going step by step each time, looking for different opportunities to uh, bring the, the the financing uh, from different sides together to make it happen. So that is, I think, that always has been uh, the challenge and uh, that probably also will remain like that in the future. Um, 
talking about that part of um, sustainability and we can of course not neglect uh, the current situation that we are in the current uh, crisis um, concerning COVID and what the effects are for mobility but also for how we organize ourselves and how do we relate and present ourselves in um, context of our society but also in, inside of the cultural sector and um, for that I would like to also point out um, I think it can be uh, interesting to connect with other platforms and networks that are already uh, working on that in smaller groups and I'm not sure if you have already um, uh, that already came about in your program but I would like to mention in this context also reshape which is a plat European project that unfortunately just uh, already finished up for three years this, this brought together different uh, cultural practitioners from Europe and uh, uh, southern Mediterranean region to um, investigate together how can you bottom up um, develop different strategies to uh, to change the narrative of how cultural production takes place and uh, tapping into their knowledge uh, we um, organize for example next week in Rotterdam hopefully because the lockdown measures are starting to become more tight also here in the Netherlands um, we have invited one of the people who was connected in uh, the reshape network to um, to talk about this and to um, to open up a conversation and they used um, the tarot tool it's a tarot deck that they developed especially for that as one of the many tools that they did um, to uh, to go into conversation with each other with the residency organizers that will be there as well um, the reshape doesn't exist anymore but they have uh, a network or, or the platform is a website as well and they have um, very well documented uh, all their different working groups that they had and the outcomes of uh, of these sessions that they had over the three years so that is uh, that that i wanted to mention as well so when we talk about how to invest in uh, creating sustainable networks. I think the most important thing is to really look what is close to home uh, from the perspective or from an international perspective, but also how those two are always intertwined. So in that sense, um, connect to your region, um, invest in relationships with uh, colleagues that are uh, in that region and also between the different regions in the, for example, in Europe, European context. I have to tell you that the everyday topics and tasks that we do are becoming more and more complex. Uh, so it is a, a busy time of the um, life of the institution that I represent. Oh, and also maybe it is important that I'm the deputy director of the theater and also the dramaturg. And uh, I was uh, uh, responsible for international relations for many years. Uh, but before I start uh, to tell you all about our plans, uh, let me shortly introduce you my institution. Uh, I know that for many of you, this is already an old story, but uh, not all of you have heard about uh, Kabulsa. So we are both a city and a government uh, funded cultural institution located in the Moscovo area of the city. Our company uh, consists of 21 company members. And I know that for many of you in the audience and also in front of the cameras, this uh, seems to be uh, a quite big institutions, but uh, honestly in the field of Hungary and in, uh, according to the system of the Hungarian cultural institutions, this is uh, rather a, a medium sized uh, institution. So we mainly play for young audiences we offer theater plays for babies, for kindergarten pupils, and for elementary students. But uh, we believe that puppetry is a form uh, of art that can, uh, that can address all ages. So even teenagers and adults. Um, so it was a very nice moment when the theatrical concept of the local ECOC team also uh, engaged this idea. So thank you very much for that. Um, Kabotsa produces five to six new productions every theatrical season. 
And um, we are very proud that we have our uh, own workhouse where we produce our own costumes, props and puppets. We have a sewing lady who's been uh, working with us for nearly 20 years now and also talented carpenters and uh, we invite designers for our productions. Our artistic team is made of the seven puppeteers and myself. Uh, and I've been uh, working for the theater since uh, 2013. Uh, our theater started out as an amateur group uh, during the 90s. Um, and it became an, officially, uh, an official institution in 2001. So this means that we are proudly celebrating our 20th anniversary this season. Uh, unfortunately, of course, the huge uh, celebrations for the public were um, washed away by the pandemics, but we tried to find some, uh, uh, some alternative ways uh, to remind ourselves of our history. So we organized an interactive um, and online exhibition and uh, our anniversary book is actually being published right at the moment when I speak. So uh, you may wonder what kabutsa means. Uh, it is the tiny insect called uh, cicada in English. Uh, it is not the, not the nicest creature, but its name has a nice local sound in Hungarian. And I also know people who say that it makes a nice sound. Uh, I am not sure that all of you share this opinion, but it is a challenge even for us uh, as a professional institution and a bunch of creative people to really identify ourselves with this nice or maybe not so nice creature. So even during the last uh, and short 20 years, we were struggling to find our visual identity. Here you can uh, find the logo that we've been working with in the last uh, couple of years. And it is still under construction and also under development, uh, but we lately decided that we are going to concentrate on the wings. So it is an abstract symbol that we use, uh, and we really want to learn how to fly with that. Uh, fly beyond our boundaries and challenges and over borders. Uh, we also organize uh, our outdoor festival called Kobotia the Family Festival, which is an open air event on several days. And as the title suggests, it aims to satisfy every family member with different art repertoire. During the ECOC years, our goal is to open this festival up for the international uh, artists and audiences. And uh, this development is one of our biggest dreams for the upcoming years. Let me show you a short video, uh, just to give you an insight of what uh, the atmosphere of the festival has. now about our international relations. So um, we are very privileged that we are uh, invited to go and perform abroad uh, on a regular basis. We have uh, some connections with our neighbor countries. Uh, for example, we work together with Timisoara, uh, with the Chiki Gerge State uh, Theater. 
We believe that it is a unique opportunity that different eco cities uh, share the same language uh, in the same year. So when it turned out that Timisoara's eco year is delayed, uh, we immediately started to work together uh, and to produce uh, co-productions with the Romanian puppet theater. At the end of uh, February in 2022, we will have the premiere of Bang Bang, one of our biggest national dramas, uh, in which we invited several actors from the uh, Chiki Gerge Theater, and also Petrofi, the local drama theater, is a co-productional partner in that project. The rehearsals will be uh, both in West Frame and in Timisoara, so um, this is not an easy task during COVID. So let's cross our fingers that um, the borders will not be closed down again. Um, but this is a contemporary uh, example of working uh, internationally. And uh, let me just uh, tell you the story how we uh, all started to work on an international level. Um, so this is the time when I have to mention the name of uh, Karel van Ransbeck. Uh, he is a Belgian director and he had a huge influence on our theater. Um, Karel is the artistic director of Theater de, uh, Theater de Spiegel, a small uh, theater in Antwerp. But he used to study in Hungary, actually, at the state um, um, puppet theater, and he knows a lot about the Hungarian uh, puppetry traditions. Uh, he met Andrea Seke, our former director uh, in that school, and um, 20 years later, he was invited to work with our company. Uh, he produced the show Hodede uh, in 2010, and according to the concept, uh, we were uh, planning two versions of the performance. Um, one of them was uh, supposed to be uh, premiered in Antwerp, and one of them with the Hungarian cast in West Ham. Uh, but uh, Kora decided that the Hungarian team was more uh, creative and efficient, so he then cancelled his own premiere in his own theater, and then he just uh, started to focus on, focus on us, uh, which was really a great, a great honor. Uh, the show was a non-verbal performance, and it only used sounds and music uh, as for the acoustics, and the puppets were abstract and non-figurative creatures. There was not a strict narrative to follow, um, and the actions on stage focused on general themes as the dynamics between uh, the performance, for example. Hodeda became such a huge success uh, that it was invited to several festivals, and it um, toured in many countries and also in many continents. So the actors performed uh, nearly 60 shows abroad, um, which is a high number uh, according to our level. Um, these tours were organized between 2010 and 2016, and uh, the first uh, and one of the most important things we learned from that was that for a theater who gets invited to foreign countries, um, it is a necessity to have someone in the staff who is responsible for international relations. So uh, since 2012, uh, we always had a staff member actually uh, who was responsible for the organizations of these uh, tours and uh, for the applications of the festivals. And sometimes this really seemed to be a luxurious thing, but actually it became very crucial even nowadays. Uh, so yes, here you can see the different countries where the um, Hodeda was invited. Uh, but just to give you some other examples of our uh, recent uh, tours, so our production Dagoraitan was also uh, invited to the United States in 2018. We performed in Los Angeles in, and in San Francisco uh, for the Hungarian minorities. We were also invited uh, by the Kaunas National uh, Theater for their festival Dive into the Theater, where we had to find a solution to overcome the language barriers. Um, we performed two of our shows. Um, one of them is uh, uh, titled Koju Ukila the Witch. Um, for this occasion, we involved a young actor from the Lithuanian staff who gave live narration on the story while our actor performed. And we even brought a copy of the costume that was given to this young man. So the entire presence uh, of the interpreter on stage was involved in the performance. So we had uh, rehearsals before that, and it was really a huge success, and the children really loved uh, the effort. 
And the other show, uh, you can see a picture of that, is uh, a nonverbal performance, so it was not that difficult to enjoy for the Lithuanian children. So we stayed at this, uh, at this festival for nine days, arrived home after a 24 hour long bus drive <laughs> uh, on the 9th of May 2020. And a week later, um, the lockdown started because of COVID. And it was unbelievable actually to leave the curfew and all the regulations uh, just a couple of days after all the nice experiences we had in a very international um, group of people. So working on an international level also meant that we became uh, members of international organizations during the years. Um, it made our work more efficient uh, because of uh, these networks um, really share information. So information became very, very um, available. We learned uh, a lot on funding possibilities, uh, festival applications and workshops. And uh, we simply got to know other theaters that uh, were in the similar situations as we are, and uh, we shared the same challenges. So for theaters performing for children, the largest and the most well-known organization is ASITES. I'm sure that many of you already heard about it. We are a member of that as well, but we are not that active because it, it is a worldwide organization. And uh, most of the times their meetings are not even on this continent, so it was difficult to participate, but let's hope that we will have the chance later on. But there is another organization called uh, Small Size Big Citizens, and this is uh, an Italian-based organization which focuses on the very young audience. La Baracca Testoni Ragazzi developed the methodology and know-how on how to perform for babies who are under the age of three. Um, because we perform for babies and this is just uh, magic. <laughs> the previously mentioned Karel van Ransbeck is a board director of this organization and he invited us to become members. Between 2014 and 2018, we were really active. We managed to travel to many of their festivals. Uh, we participated in many gatherings and workshops. So, uh, and also they gave us the possibility to invite performances from uh, Italy and the Netherlands, which was a very important, uh, which was a very important step uh, in audience education. Um, it is inspiring for yourself to collect new imp impressions abroad, but it is also crucial to share as much of these with your audience so they can follow you on your artistic journey. In baby performances, uh, most of the times the, there is no usage of language. Um, and also not many theaters perform for babies, but if they do, it is very uh, common that they have very light uh, set design, so it is easy to take with you on airplanes and on trains. Um, we didn't know this uh, at the beginning, so when we were invited to go to Taiwan in 2017 with our performance Carnival of Animals, we actually had to have the crew who invited us uh, to reproduce all the stuff that we use in the performance so we have another set uh, and but this way we didn't have to carry very heavy, heavy luggages uh, overseas so working with uh, international directors and designers is a, a very nice way to bring new life and a new artistic input uh, in our everyday work uh, but at the beginning it was very difficult to know and to learn that uh, in order to to do that, you have to schedule at least two or three years ahead. And uh, maybe this is very obvious for you, but this was uh, not easy to learn at the beginning. So even nowadays, uh, when we invite international artists, uh, scheduling is always a huge issue because we have a huge uh, fluctuation of the staff in the theater for many uh, reasons, but it is uh, kind of difficult to keep the promises that we give to uh, involved artists. Um, I was one of the lucky ones who was able to participate in the Tandem Capital of Cultures program in 2019. Um, may I get the next slide, please? Um, and I am very happy to see that actually on Friday you will have a presentation uh, by uh, 
Philip and Yanaka about the projects. I'm not going to uh, go very much in details with that. But uh, during these uh, three international meetings, different professionals from various artistic fields were brought together to connect and to try to develop projects uh, and project ideas together for the ECOP cities. So by the end of the first meeting, we had to find a partner from another ECOP city, and then we had to visit each other. Uh, I found a partner from uh, Free Strat Festival, and I had the chance to visit uh, Leuven and twice, and also we traveled together to Belgium for a um, um, huge street theater showcase. Uh, but most, I mean, it was really surprising that the most um, uh, creative time and the most inspiring time we spent together uh, with my tandem partner was the time when she visited me in West Brim. Mm. I, had the, I had to explain her how our theater functions on an everyday level. She met our staff, watched our performances, and she made observations on our challenges from a very different perspective, a perspective I could uh, never have. So I later realized that the artistic project development, which our task was during these meetings, was not only a tool, or it was only a tool. The real goal was for us to connect and to bond in a way. So the tandem connections do exist and function, even without the realization of the planned projects. They work on local level as well, because there were um, three representatives from West Brim selected to participate in this project. So I shared these wonderful journeys with excellent people. And uh, Tandem Connections work on international level as well. Kabutsa works on two international projects now with uh, professionals from the Tandem team. And I also saw comments from Arda actually in the chat now. So let me just give you <laughs> some waves and a big hug. So um, one of uh, these projects is Global Roots um, uh, in the next Please, which is an Erasmus Plus funded project where artists and uh, teachers and cultural managers work together on creating a healthy and safe learning environment for children who are hit by the climate crisis and catastrophe and have to fight depression. The participating partners are from the Netherlands, from Germany, from Sweden, uh, from Hungary, of course, uh, and the project management team is called for Princeton a Danish organization. A funny twist in this story is that actually I, um, I only knew that I know one of the participants from Tandem when, I, when we first had our online kickoff meeting. Uh, so it was strange to just stare each other uh, in front of the camera and say that, okay, so now we are going to participate in this project again together. So it was really a nice, uh, a nice uh, thing. Uh, during this two year long project, uh, Corona was of course a huge issue and it made our work more difficult and also much deeper in a way, uh, because we shortly realized that uh, some of the planned international meetings will be abolished because of the different regulations of the different countries. Uh, so we decided to organize online workshops uh, on a regular basis. And, uh, an online meeting is actually quite easy to attend. <laughs> and in a way we reduce the physical boundaries between each other. Uh, so when we finally had the chance to meet each other in West Brim uh, this September, we greeted each other as we already been good friends. So I know that there will be another presentation on Erasmus Plus later on in this uh, conference. So I'm not going to uh, talk about the structure, uh, how this, um, project goes, but let me emphasize a couple of things, which I find interesting in our perspective. So it is always a huge question how to bring home your experiences from abroad, uh, how to involve your colleagues and staff in the adventures you had. Um, Erasmus Plus is a fantastic opportunity because it gives you the chance to involve many people from your institution. Uh, so, on the job shadowing part, delegate as many people as possible. And uh, this also means that you have to have uh, people who speak languages fluently, but uh, this is also a great opportunity to practice foreign language skills. 
during the two year long uh, international cooperation, you have to develop real content. It is not just a project plan, it is a detailed content you produce together. In our case, in Global Roots, uh, we developed workshops for students uh, on the topic of sustainability, which we have to realize already in uh, three local schools. After these pilot workshops, each of the Erasmus partners uh, presented the methodology they use for each other and also the consequences we have. Um, and now we develop a workshop plan together with all these experiences. We give these test workshops back to the teachers that we used to work with, uh, who are going to evolve it in their curriculum. And they give us feedback again, which we can also share again on an international level. So um, as you can see, there are several, several steps in order to finalize the end product. Um, the real great thing is that during the fund application, you have to develop a dissemination strategy already. Uh, so during the entire process, you have to reflect on the working methods you share together with your uh, partners and you have a ready-made plan on how to share this knowledge. Um, we are halfway down the road with Global Roots now, uh, but we decided to apply for another Erasmus Plus uh, application um, for the next two years uh, period, because uh, we really want to produce real nice content together with the partners. So I hope I will be able to share this end product with you someday. Um, and in the next dia, uh, I can show you a couple of pictures. Uh, these uh, pictures were taken on the job shadowing when we visited uh, Berlin. Um, we worked in a school called Güntiger Grundschule, uh, where our partner side views uh, involved us actually in the re realization of their uh, workshops. Um, so this school is located in Kreuzberg, Berlin, and we had, to, we had the chance to work together with children from many, many countries. Uh, and on the other picture, you see the international group, actually, when we had our first real life meeting here in West Spring. So to finalize uh, my thoughts on the lessons we learned from our international cooperations, is that every time you have the chance to go abroad, or just meet new professionals, it always gives you a new perspective. This perspective can be a new way of how you see others or how you see yourself. So I've got my essay. <laughs> um, but either way, it, either way, it is very useful. So hopefully you learn new values or you realize that you share, share values with other people whom you just recently got to know. So every time you get this feeling, you start to form a community together and you have common goals. Uh, you start to identify yourself on a European, European level and not just on a national or local level, uh, which is more than inspiring actually. And when you are inspired, it is your responsibility to inspire your local community and your co-workers and uh, colleagues or even your family so they can follow you in this road. Together, you can start then to adopt the knowledge and the know-how and the new methodologies for your needs and uh, circumstances so you can all grow together. And in our case, in Kabota, uh, actually this is uh, a way of how, to, how we try to learn to fly together. So during the pandemic, we actually uh, decided that we want to do uh, an artistic uh, movement with the Small Size Big Citizens um, organization. And um, we produced uh, a, a short video together.
Sylvain Cornu, I'm the head of international coordination and um, partnerships at the Canada Council for the Arts. Uh, before, uh, so I'm going to do a quick introduction about uh, about the Council, about Canada, and maybe opportunities for international uh, collaboration. Um, I spent half of my life in Canada and the other half in France. So I was born in France. And I'm sure you can see that I have, still have my French accent. I'm sure you all know a little bit Canada, but I think it's important to give you a little bit of context and especially the context I will share with you is important when we think about international collaboration. So uh, the Canada has uh, uh, 10 provinces and three territories and uh, it, the territory extends from the Atlantic to the Pacific and northward into the Arctic Ocean. So covering more or less 10 million square kilometers, making it the oldest second largest country by total area in the world. And coast to coast, Canada, it's 5,800 kilometers. So when you imagine that like between Montreal and Vancouver, and Montreal is not like the far east of Canada, but between Montreal and Vancouver, there is like uh, 4,500 kilometers. And between Montreal and Paris, there's 5,500 kilometers. So it's not a big difference. The vastness of the territory has a huge impact on artistic mobility, touring and international cooperation. And moreover, with only 38 million inhabitants, Canada has a, as many inhabitants than Poland and two times less than France. So Canada cultural interior market is quite limited. A lot of artists and arts organization here needs to export, work in collaboration with foreign partner to be able to make a living. So more or less, Arts, culture, and heritage in Canada represent more than uh, fifty-seven billion dollars in the Canadian economy, and close to six thousand uh, six hundred seventy-three thousand jobs in sectors such as film, video, broadcasting, music, publishing, archives, performing arts, heritage institutions, festivals, and celebrations. Um, art and culture in Canada is uh, financially uh, supported in various ways by all levels of government. So the federal level, like the Canada Council for the Arts, provincial level, territorial level, and municipal level. So um, the federal, the provincial, and the territorial governments all have a department or arts council with responsibility for culture. And some jurisdictions have also uh, additional specialized bodies to support particular cultural industries, such like, for example, Telefilm Canada at the federal, federal level, or the Saskatchewan Film and Video Development Corporation in Saskatchewan at the provincial level. So I thought most of the funding for arts and cultural institutions comes from arts council and cultural departments. Funding is all, often also available from other departments, such as like economic development, tourism, education, parks, recreation. In some provinces, lottery revenues are, are also a source of funding for cultural and, and other like charitable causes. And philanthropy is also quite important in Canada. Um, at the federal level, also uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs, so that's our equivalent of a minister, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, uh, promotes and protects Canadian cultural interests internationally and have also funding to support cultural activities organized by the network of the Canadian embassies uh, abroad. Uh, we have also funding for creative export for projects that generate export revenues and help Canadian creative industries reach more people around the world. And you have the Canada Council for the Arts. Like, so the main arts founder with a very robust international program called Arts Abroad. So if uh, uh, we move to the next slide, the, the Canada Council for the Arts particularly has the mandate to foster and promote the study and enjoyment of and the production of works in the arts. So it's a, it's a federal crown corporation that is accountable to parliament 
through the Minister of Canadian Heritage. And uh, the council is governed by an 11-member board. And the Canadian Commission for UNESCO uh, operates under the authority of the Canadian Council, the Canada Council for the Arts. In, uh, so last year, in the middle of the pandemic, we uh, launched it, uh, a new strategic plan. Uh, and as you know, the impact of the pandemic was devastating on the arts sector. But artists, groups, and arts organizations, to their credit, were quite resilient, continued to create and find new ways to reach us. So their resilience became ours, and their artistic offerings our protection against isolation. So our strategic plan was inspired by, by, by the pandemic and by how the artists uh, did react to, to the pandemic. Uh, so this plan puts into words our analysis of the current situation, our vision for the future of the sector and the role we intend to play to contribute to that future. And we have three main objectives. One is invest in rebuilding and innovation. The other one is to amplify the benefits of the arts for society. And the third one is to nurture and expand collaboration and partnerships in Canada and abroad. And international collaboration is an important part of the rebuilding. And with our international partners, we intend to build on the trust, like mindness and collaborative experience to advance our common objectives in a radically different context. And we are also keen to deepen some regional collaboration to further carve out space for artistic exchange, to develop common cultural narratives beyond political and state relations, and include diasporic artistic communities from Canada. Um, next slide is the, our international commitment. So as public funder, we have to support innovative ways to engage on the international stage and continue to deliver a wide range of international initiatives. The pandemic has led to a major shift towards online delivery models of international activities, including like uh, residencies, leadership program, creative collaboration remotely. So we will maintain international cooperation as continued international exchanges in an important part of the recovery plan for the sector, but also we want to embrace and leverage new opportunities and the exploration of new processes, new ways to connect uh, globally. So uh, mainly uh, we support uh, Canadian organization, artists, collectives to, uh, through uh, our granting programs to uh, collaborate with the rest of the world, to tour, to travel, to develop markets, to develop co-production, to do some residencies, all kind of different level of support. But we also more and more work in partnerships with other uh, organization uh, in the world, other arts council, ministries of culture, various stakeholders could be cities at some point also. And we really try to do it in close collaboration now with uh, also some partners in, in Canada, like municipalities, provincial council, Canadian heritage, the, the ministries of Canadian heritage and Global Affairs Canada. Um, our priorities, uh, as you can, oh, it's next slide, sorry, I forgot to tell you. Can you, yeah, so, so I'm on the, on this slide. So the, our priorities really, and, and, and is uh, indigenous arts and also our commitment to work in a spirit of uh, self-determination, decolonization of our processes, uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, deaf and disability arts, use, climate change, and innovation. And I'm sure it's some of the priorities you always like share in Europe, in your um, different countries. Um, next slide. So, yeah, we also, uh, uh, we have also developed in the past and we continue to do so uh, some strategic initiatives with partners uh, abroad, uh, like 
for example, with the Edinburgh festivals, where we had a Canada hub in the uh, before the pandemic. We also are commissioner of the for the um, Canadian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in Architectures, and are also a uh, main founder of the uh, Canadian participation in the Venice Biennale in in um, visual arts. We are working with a lot of networks and and event in the world like such womex uh, ispa the international society for performing arts the international um, uh, network for uh, young audience in performing arts we uh, have worked also with uh, a lot to organize some canada focus with with partners in the work and sometimes to put in place some mechanism of uh, collaboration exchange like joint funds residency program and things like that. We are also part of different network, like uh, the, maybe the, the, the two most important one is like the IFACA, it's the International Federation of Arts Council and Cultural Agencies. Our CEO is the chair of this network um, uh, that includes like, I think more or less than 80 countries uh, in, in the world. And obviously I mentioned at the beginning the, that the Canadian um, Commission for UNESCO was under the umbrella of the Canada Council for the Arts. And we work very closely. And uh, for example, uh, with the Creative Cities uh, Network that I'm sure you, you know. Um, and also in terms of cultural diplomacy, um, uh, Canada uh, is a little bit back. <laughs> Uh, between like 20, what is it, like 2010 and 2020, uh, uh, the Canada did not do a lot of things in terms of cultural diplomacy abroad and did not invest a lot of money. But uh, with the actual government and with also the willingness of, of different crown corporations like the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, we work a lot more closely with Canadian mission abroad on different like uh, aspect of cultural diplomacy um, and with the keeping in mind like the respect of artistic voice no instrumentalization but working all together with international partners on like the promotion of uh, constructive uh, dialogues and on different like message and exchanges related to our like strategic priorities for the first first time in in, in our history in Canada, we have uh, an indigenous uh, person who is the chair of the Canada Council for the Arts. It's Jesse Wenty. And what was very interesting is like uh, when he was appointed as new chair of the council, he said that his goal was simply to reduce the harm Canada Council causes. So, and I think it's a quite powerful statement because uh, it's true that like uh, the Canada Council for the Arts is, 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 is like in, on the model of the council in, in Europe and, and especially the Arts Council England has be, is a completely uh, a, a, a based on a model of, uh, of, of colonization. And in the past, like everything we have been doing and how we have organized our program and how we have defined what's professional arts or not, what's excellency and not, has excluded people. And I think with our new strategic plan and the idea of a decolonized future for the arts, what we want to do is doing less harm and be more inclusive, for sure. What I can share with you is like, Obviously, the pandemic has shed a harsh light on the many inequities in our society, in many social systems and sectors of activity. And I think we now have an increased awareness of systemic barriers that lead to a persistent lack of equity, diversity, and inclusion in the arts, particularly in the workforce and programming of far too many publicly funded organizations. So we support a lot of organizations on core funding, so that means like multi-annual funding, and now for us, the need to address this question of equity, diversity, inclusion. Also, I think the current lack of equity and inclusion has also hindered the engagement of new audiences and limited, limited the flourishing of organization in our increasingly diverse di society. So we have put in place mechanism and some special amount of, of money and funding available to equity seeking groups such as obviously deaf, disabled artists, but also racialized, black, indigenous. So we have really decided to 
give them like more opportunities. And also, I think what's very important for an organization like the Canada Council is how do you distribute the funding? And who's at the table, who's making the decision? And we have worked a lot also on our peer assessment model because we distribute funding through peer assessment. But who are the peer? What's a peer? Who should be at the table? Who should make the decision? Are we uh, inclusive enough? Like, are we only bringing white people to decide on funding? So I think we have like made a lot of progress. And I think it's quite important for all the organization to reflect on that, like how you become more equitable, diverse and inclusive. Also, I think some business models in general in the arts have reached their limit and will launch next week a very new uh, fund for innovation to support innovative models to create new possibilities in the arts, but also to include like more people. So different ways, but I would be more than happy to share with Sylvia like the, our whole uh, strategy in terms of reaching and working with deaf and disabled artists. Also, I have to tell you that at Council, we have a lot of program officers like in charge of like the relation with the community and, and in charge to distribute the grants and put in place like the mechanism of peer assessment committee. And some of them are deaf or disabled. So Canada Council workforce, like the, our employees, there is also diversity and, and inclusion. And also we obviously, like a lot of organizations, translate, have targeted engagement strategy to reach out, like, for example, the deaf community, where, like, you know, you have to put in place different, like, strategy to, to make sure that they feel included and that they can also access our program. Mm-hmm.